Okie doke. Can um can everybody see my screen? I'm gonna yes. I'm gonna turn it off. Yes. So we can yes. Listen. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Okay, so everyone can. Oops. Okay. Yes. Good. Good. Great. Um, hello, everyone. I am so excited to talk to everyone today. Um, I really love the animals that I study and the work that I do, uh, and I'm really excited to talk about that a little bit today. I just wanted to give a little disclaimer. I have two dogs in my apartment with me. You can see one is sleeping right now. Um, so if you hear groaning or like dog noises, it's because I have two dogs. Um, that's kind of the, one of the fun parts about being a wildlife ecologist is that um, I get a job, I have a job where I get uh, to take my dogs with me a lot of places. Um, but yep, as Kristen said, um, please ask questions throughout and save your questions and we'll stop a handful of times throughout to just uh, give you a chance to ask some questions. I really, really love talking about this stuff, so I'm very excited. Um, but I first wanted to just talk about um, the fact that I'm a wildlife ecologist. So I am a graduate student at the University of Wyoming, which means that I get paid to learn right now. So I went through um, my elementary school and then I went through high school and I still really liked school. So I went to college. And then when I was in college, I really, really realized that I still liked school and I really like learning and I like science and animals and that sort of thing. So then I went on to graduate school. So this is like a second chunk of college. So most of my day I just spend thinking uh, about uh, mule deer right now, um, but in the past I've worked on different projects where I got to work with chipmunks and trap chipmunks. Um, once I worked in Africa and so I got to handle and uh, study a bunch of things there and then I also um, sometimes get to just be out in the field and I haven't worked with snakes explicitly, but I um, you know get to see them out while I'm out and around. Um, so right now, the main thing that I am studying is actually mule deer. So even though I have this broad background and I've got to learn about all sorts of different critters, um, right now I'm focusing primarily on mule deer. And so right here, what you can see is uh, we're on, we, we have to capture the mule deer twice a year. And I'll talk about that a little bit more later on. But on the left here, you can see me. I'm all bundled up because it's really cold outside because we capture them in the winter. Um, but there I am with the mule deer. And then in the summer, I'm lucky enough that I get to go and uh, catch fawns and see, see deer right, right about when they're first born. Um, okay, so a deer is this thing that is called an ungulate. So an ungulate is a mammal that has hooves. So uh, can anybody tell me other animals that live in Wyoming, or maybe that don't live in Wyoming, that are ungulates? No, it's a, a video. Sorry, everybody, for the confusion. Um, so if you want to answer, I see some of you typing in the box. So we'll do this in the future. Um, if you guys just want to write your answers. So Rowan says a llama. Logan says a sheep and Molly says a sheep. Mia says an elk. And Laura said, or Savior, sorry, says a cow. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, these are all right. Really good job. You guys know your ungulates very well. So um, we have a ton of animal. We have a ton of ungulates here in uh, Wyoming. We're really fortunate to have them here. Um, and yeah, the one that I look at a lot and think about a lot are mule deer, which I'm sure most of you have seen out and about. And here's a picture in case you haven't uh, seen them out before. So. I wanted to walk everyone through the first year of life as a deer because uh, I think as scientists a lot of times we focus on the adults and that's what we normally see a lot uh, like when we're driving down the road or whatever when we see deer along the side of the road or if we see deer in our backyards we normally see them as adults but they have really cool things that happen to them when they are um, when they're young when they're fawns so when they're under one year old they're called 
fawns. And so this is a picture of a fawn here. Um, actually, well, it's two fawns. Um, most of the time when deer are born, they are born as twins. And so these are two fawns that we caught as part of our research here. You can see that they have little GPS collars on them. So this is what those collars end up looking like. And we can talk a little bit more about these um, later, but this is how we're able to study these deer. And this is why we're doing all of the research that we are um, doing right now. And so we can tell how old a fawn is uh, for the first handful of days anyway, is by its hooves. And so, um, and we don't normally know this unless you get to handle these animals, but when fawns are first born, the bottom of their hooves uh, are actually like kind of this yellowy jelly thing. It's really soft and squishy. Um, which is weird because when you think of fawns or when you think of adult ungulates like mule deer, uh, their hooves are really hard and sharp, right? But um, when they're fawns, they're really soft uh, for those first few hours. And then as they age over the first handful of days, this white bit on their hooves that you can see right here, um, it slowly turns to all black. So we can tell, um, yeah, how old they are based on on their hooves. And also, just as a fun fact, um, does anybody know what hooves are made out of? You guys can answer in the chat. All right, so we have some answers. So Laura says keratin. Aiden says, is that the answer, Rihanna? Yes. Good job. Yeah. Keratin. Get it. That's, yeah, really good job. Um, it looks like Landon, Blake, and Joe also knew keratin. Good job. Yeah, really good job. Um, also, if I have the chat up, can you all see the chat? Is that how that works? I can't see it. Um, okay, cool. Okay, cool. Then I'll maybe just leave the chat open. Um, yeah, so it's made out of keratin, and keratin is the same stuff that like our fingernails are made out of. So basically, when mule deer are walking around, they're walking around on like their on their fingernails. Um, so just think about that next time you see some deer walking around. Um, okay, so mule deer uh, fawns when they're first born, they're not really good at running away. They're not really um, they're not really fast. They're not super sturdy. They're kind of just you know. I have a video in a minute, and you'll kind of see that they walk in a kind of a weird way. Um, but what they rely on uh, to stay safe is to, um, they use camouflage and they hide so that they can't be detected. So that means that to do our work, to be, uh, to do other research that we do with these mule deer, we have to go out and find them. And sometimes it's really easy and sometimes it's really hard. So um, there are two pictures here, and each one of them has a mule deer fawn in it. And I wanted to see, can you guys find the fawns? Just take a minute and look really carefully at the pictures. And Rhiannon, and, um, while people are looking, it looks like Aiden has a question. And Ooh. Aiden's question is, do their mothers protect them? Oh, this is a really good question. So kind of, most of the time, um, the things that the mom does to help them, to help protect them are to help them avoid being noticed by things like predators. So mom will actually usually eat kind of far away from her fawns. So the fawns will like tuck themselves up under bushes and under trees and that sort of thing so that they can um, be hidden. And then mom will also eat far away so that she might be distracting anything away from those fawns. And then also, um, fawns rely on not having any smells so or not smelling at all so normally when predators are looking for animals they are relying on hi. their scent and so hi. <laughs> and so um for fawns they uh they try to like not have any smells so the mom will lick them right after they're born to remove any smells and then actually fawns don't really um poop on their own for the first handful of uh weeks after they're born, the their mom kind of licks them and then helps them poop, and that helps to reduce the smell. So, yes, she protects them, um, but she kind of does it in this way of just hiding them. Um, but also, sometimes if those fawns are being um, in danger, so like sometimes um, 
you know, if a predator is coming up and catching a fawn and the, fl- the fawn makes a noise, it's called a bleat. And it kind of sounds like, oh, let's see if I can do this. Like, bah, bah. <laughs> that's kind of what a fawn sounds like. Um, and then the mom will run in and she can kind of use her front two paw or two uh, legs and kind of, you know, kick the predator away. So yeah, she kind of protects them um, in whatever way she can. And one more question from Laura, who wants to know, are they fast? Ooh, so mule deer, when they're grown up, can be very fast. I'll show you a video in just a second here. Um, mule deer fawns aren't very fast when they are first born, um, but after about five days, oh, I couldn't catch them. Uh, so when we go and do our work, we have to go and catch the fawns within one or two days. And after that, um, it's really hard to catch them because they, yeah, they are very fast and they're really good jumpers. So um, they would definitely outrun us. So, okay, so I hope everyone had the chance to find the fawns here. So there's one that's kind of under, tucked up in under these uh, trees over here on the right side. Um, yeah, fawns can really, really blend in. So they have, the, their fur is brown and black with white spots, which kind of mimics, or looks like the way that sun moves through trees and shrubs and that sort of thing. So it's actually really hard to find the fawns. But then sometimes out here on the on the left side over here, um, sometimes the fawns are just kind of out in the middle of nowhere. Um, so this fawn isn't hidden very well. But also if you think about how big forests are, it's really going to be hard to find this fawn, especially if you can't smell it. So if you're a predator, you have to walk really, really, you basically have to walk on top of it. And actually sometimes um, this happened one time where we were out looking for fawns and we, there were um, three of us researchers in a line and I was the third one and the first two researchers stepped over a fawn. They didn't, they didn't see it and we were out looking for fawns. We knew where the fawns were supposed to be, but they're so well camouflaged um, that sometimes even, you know, us who are out there trying to research them can't quite see them. Um, when do they go away from their mother and live on their own? That's not a stupid question at all. We're going to get to that. Is it okay if I save that question for a little bit later? Um, it's about a, when they're about a year old. So we'll, we'll get back to that. That's a really, really good question. And that's um, kind of the basis for a lot of the research that I do. So thank you for asking it. Um, okay. So this is the coloring page that everyone was sent. And so you don't have to color this right now, but maybe just later on if you're coloring this and you want to find the two fonts that are in here and then try to color them so that they blend in with their surroundings, right? So again, fonts have that brown and black fur with the white spots and that really does actually help them um, blend in. Okay. So this is kind of the sort of area where fawns are born. Um, so this is a picture that I took while I was out researching fawns. So what are some things that you notice about, um, about this habitat? And if you want to just um, respond in the group chat, that would be great. It's high up. Yes, absolutely. It has nice soft grass. Yes. It's on a hill. Absolutely. Mountains. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. You guys think about deer a lot and trees and grass, lots of trees for protect. Yeah. Wow. You guys know all of these things. So there are these areas that have nice patches of grass um, and that's really nice for the mom to eat. And then there's also these nice little areas where there's trees. And so that's nice areas to just kind of hide. Um, yeah, you can hide your fawns. You can hide there as a, as a mom, anything. Um, it's high up. So normally in their summer ranges. So this is where um, we're on one of the mule deer summer ranges up here. They tend to be up high in the mountains. In our study area, they're around um, seven to 9,000 feet. So a little bit higher than many of the towns where we live here um, in Wyoming. It looks like a national park. Yeah, so this is actually on national forest land on, or uh, sorry, on, um, yeah, <laughs> on uh, forest service land. So uh, this is federally protected um, land. So these are all really good comments. And this is, yeah, this is awesome. 
Uh, so this is a video. I'm going to see if this, this might not work. Okay. Okay. It will work, I think. Okay. So um, mule deer fawns are with their moms for that first little bit of life in particular. They're like super reliant on their moms and they're not really able to walk. But here, this was a picture from two summers ago where we were out and we weren't looking for this fawn or this mom and her fawns because we, we look for deer that have radio collars. And I'll talk about those in a little bit more in a second. But um, you can see that the fawns are just kind of like following mom and seeing where they go. And then when do they start walking? Um, they can kind of wobble after like a day or even during that first day, depending on them. Um, and they, when they walk, they kind of stumble a little bit, but they can really start really cruising after a day or two. Um, so for that very first day, they can stand up, they can kind of take a few steps, but they're really weak. And so they kind of fall back down. But after a handful of days, then they can run. They're, they're good to go. They're, they can run faster than me. So, okay, so here's just a video and hopefully that shows up. But if you can see, there's the mom, right? And so she's walking down a hill. They were walking down um, to some, to uh, a little river so that they could drink. And the fawns are following behind her. So mom is like looking around. She's checking out to see if there's any predators and to see if it's safe. And then those, the fawns just kind of like follow behind her, right? Yeah, kind of like horses. Why do fawns have spots? These are not dumb questions, everyone. I'm so happy that you're asking all of them. So the spots actually help them with their camouflage that we were talking about a little bit ago. Um, and so it might not, it doesn't seem like it when they're out here because they're walking around and this isn't necessarily when they would try to be as camouflaged, but if they're hiding under a sagebrush, the way, if you ever like stand on top of the sagebrush and look down, it looks like there's little packets, like pa patches of, of white and brown and black and that sort of thing. And so the fawn fur that has those white spots, it looks like exactly like that. Like it's really, really hard to see them if they're tucked up under a sagebrush. So it helps them with their, um, with hiding. How many pounds are fawns? Ooh, good question. Um, five to 10 ish. Uh, so it can, it can depend. Um, but in, it depends on how, um, early you get there, but when we first get there, like in a day or two, they're normally um, between five and, and 10 pounds. Yeah. Oh, I don't know how fast they can run. Way faster than me. I'm not a very fast runner though, so maybe that's that's not a good metric, but or a good measure, but um, they can run pretty fast, but the moms can run faster than the fawns. <laughs> Okay, let's watch that video just one more time. I've watched this video so many times. I love it. <laughs> and, but here, and so these fawns are like probably five-ish days old. And so you can see that they're able to walk quite a bit. Um, whereas if they're one or two days old, then it's, they just kind of are really wobbly and they can't quite stand up. So now I want, Am I going to show them running? Um, I don't have any videos of them running. I'm sorry. Um, but here, so now we're going to talk about their habitat a little bit. So lupine, lupin, this purple flower that's shown here is one of the flowers that's really, really important for adult deer. And so it's really important what do, adult deer are eating um, because all of the fawns are nursing throughout the summer. So that's really costly for a mom. It's really expensive, right? So she has to make sure that she's really healthy so that she can give so many resources to her offspring, to her fawns. So for mom to be healthy, she has to be able to eat really good food. And lupine, lupin is one of those foods that's really good for them, and they eat it a lot. Um, and these are one of, I think, the most beautiful flowers. They're out all over. So if you're up in, um, you know, in national forest land or on Bureau of Land Management land. Basically, if you're anywhere in Wyoming, um, then you can go out and see these beautiful flowers. And just next time you see these flowers, think like, oh, mule deer really like to eat these flowers. And also, um, these flowers 
So they help to raise fawns that summer, but also moms during the summer, they're like feeding their fawns, but they're also storing food for themselves for the winter. So we'll talk a little bit about winter in a minute, but just remember that lupin is trying to help, or by, by eating lupin, the moms are storing fat for the winter. Okay, so by the end of summer, fawns are, yeah, really ready to just run. They're ready to go. So this is a picture of a fawn running away. Oh, how many deer can be in a group at one time? This is a really cool question. It really depends. So when fawns are first born, their mom will completely kick everyone else away from them. So she wants to be by herself with her fawns. So it's just her and then one or two fawns. But later on in the summer, they tend to group back up in their family groups. So she might have her daughter from a previous year join her up in a group. And then, um, you know, maybe like ants will come in. So they, they tend to stay together as, as female family members. So they'll group up like that. Um, so that can be maybe four or five. But when they migrate down to winter range, they can have groups of 30 or more. So they, it's really, it depends on, um, the time of year and also just the animal in their their family group. So, um, so if you can see where the arrow is pointing, that's a fawn just running away, and it looks like the fawn's a little bit faster than mom. Um, we were trying to you know check up on these two deer, but they were way faster than us, so we only got that that picture of them. Deer can have three babies at one time. It's very very rare. Um, usually they have two babies at once. And then um, let's see, what about the dad? So um, usually what happens is the um, female fawns will stay near their mom after they are, you know, once they're grown up, but the boy fawns will go away. So they don't tend to group back up, but um, we're, one of the questions that we're looking at, one of the questions that my research is hoping to answer is whether or not um, those male fawns so the so so um a deer's son if they like join up together again while they migrate so we don't know that for sure but generally the males go away okay so males start on that summer range that's what we were just looking at right nice high elevation there's lots of flowers um usually lots of trees not a lot of people but they don't live there all year so in the fall, mule deer actually start to migrate um, down to winter ranges. And so um, migration is a movement away from one area to another area. And so you wouldn't hang out in one of those, or you don't hang out in those two areas um, at the same time. And so animals in Wyoming migrate because up at those high elevations that we were just looking at, it's really, really great habitat in the summer, but it's really hard to live there all year round because there's just a ton of snow and not a lot of food to eat in the winter. So they book it on down to um, some lower elevation areas with sagebrush so that they can eat sagebrush um, all winter long. And so when they're migrating, deer take the same migratory routes year after year. And this is kind of crazy to think about because they're migrating through mountains, they're going through forests, across streams, up and over mountain ranges, right? And sometimes um, over, you know, 150 miles. And these animals are able to take basically the same route year after year. So think about that. Um, like if you were just out on a landscape do you think you could do that like as a researcher i'm out there and i have my little gps and sometimes i still get turned around right it's super cool so they have like sometimes we don't think of deer as being super smart but they actually are they have to be really smart right to be able to take these routes year after year they have to know where they're going in the landscape um they have to know like oh yeah there's this thing here now we have to turn right whatever right really, really cool. Deer are super cool. Um, but also one of the things that um, my research is looking at is whether they learn those routes from their moms. So we think that they learn them from their moms. So during that first fall migration that um, 
those fawns are about five months old and their moms are just showing them the routes, right? And then later on, what, what we're looking at is whether they take those same routes that they were um, introduced to by their mom that first, um, during that first five months of, of their life. And it looks like, yes. So um, that is research that's not 100% finished yet, but um, we're looking forward to sharing um, more information about that as, as we get it. But we think right now, at least, that they learn their routes from their moms. Okay. And so fawns spend the winter with their moms. So they migrate, they start on their summer range, they migrate down with their moms to um, their winter range, and then they hang out all winter long with their mom. And this again is called, um, called winter range. And so while they're there, you can notice that there's not a lot of um, those like really nice flowers, right? So there's, um, but, but they, there's a lot of sagebrush and sagebrush is available all year round. So it's not super great food for a mule deer, but it's there. So they eat a lot of sagebrush all winter long, but mostly they rely on those fat stores that they, um, that they gained during the summer. So um, think back to that lupin, that really pretty purple flower, right? They eat a bunch of that in the, in the winter. And then in the fall, they're like pretty bulky, they're pretty chunky. And then they burn through that fat all winter long. And actually, um, winter is really, really hard for mule deer just because there's not that much food that's available. And sometimes there's a lot of pressures on them, like if they're, um, if they have to move around too much or if the, the winters are too harsh. Um, so uh, actually sometimes uh, this is the hardest part of the year for, for a fawn for that very first year. And so here we have a, a picture of an animal by herself. And so maybe her fawns didn't quite make it with her. Um, but a lot of fawns do make it, but just keep in mind that winter is, is pretty hard for, for a mule deer. But do you have time make it questions. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Let's do some questions. Okay. okay. So I've got a whole list here. So I'm going to okay. back up a little bit. Uh, sorry. <laughs> That's my dog barking now. Um, so first, how many pounds is a grown deer? Oh goodness, um, 150, about. So um, we study females primarily. Um, and so a female is about 150 pounds, I think. Um, and this also depends on the time of year and whether they're pregnant or not. Um, but when we weigh them in the fall, when they're pretty, pretty bulky before they're pregnant, um, or before they're like really pregnant, um, they tend to be 150 pounds and then the males will be a little bit heavier than that. Okay, um, someone else wanted to know, how do you catch fawns? Do you have to tranquilize them or do you have to wrestle them? What do you, how do you catch them? Ooh, for fawns, nope, we do not have to tranquilize them. We don't have to wrestle them at all. Um, they just kind of lay there, right? So you just walk up to them. You, we know where they are, and I'll talk about this a little bit more um, later on, but we know where fawns are born uh, based on GPS collars. So um, this is what a collar, looks like. So this is on a deer. And then we, this will send a signal to, um, to a satellite. It's using the same technology that we have in our phones, right? And so from this, we know where the fawn is or like kind of the area where it should be. And so then we go and we sneak up on the deer, um, on mom. And normally mom is right near fawn. And so um, we sneak up and then usually mom runs away because we spook her and then um, the fawn is right around in that area. So we just kind of have to look around and we're just really careful, um, but we, you know, look very carefully. And then once we find the fawns, we are, we try to process them. We try to take all of our measurements as quickly as we can and then we leave and then mom comes back pretty quickly after we leave. So um, because they just kind of lay there, they don't, we don't really have to wrestle them or anything like that. Um, and then I'll talk about adult captures a little bit later, but we use um, helicopters for that. So, yeah. All right, maybe two more questions. And then everybody who's written questions that we haven't answered yet, um, I will make sure I write those down. And then at the end, we'll come back and make sure we get those questions answered. Um, okay. but keep them coming. So two more questions. Um, one, for how long do you deer, I'm not sure 
if it means time or distance, but how long do deer migrate? Oh, cool. Yeah. So the longest mule deer migration is about 150 miles each way. Um, and they can be that long or they can be a lot shorter. It can just be a handful of miles. Um, maybe think like 100 miles as a good um, general description. And then how long it takes them to migrate, like how many days they migrate is really very, it really depends based on the animal and the year. So sometimes it can take an animal two months to migrate. Um, sometimes it just takes them a handful of days. And so that depends on, um, well, on how long they're migrating, right? So if you're migrating a longer distance, then it's gonna take you more days to do that. But it also depends on um, whether it's spring or fall migration. So if it's in spring migration, Mule deer are trying to do this thing where they call, it's called surf the green wave. Did you guys know that mule deer can surf? Um, so in spring, right, which like we should be having right now, but instead, at least in, in Laramie, it's snowing a whole bunch. Um, but in spring, all of the vegetation, all the plants start to grow. And so these plants are really, really nutritious. They're really healthy for the, um, uh, for the deer. And so deer basically move across the landscape as the same at the same time as the plants are growing and so this is called surfing the green wave so deer that are doing that might migrate a little bit longer so. okay one more question a few people asked how much food do deer eat every day i don't know that's a really good question i don't know um they are basically eating all day long um i mean they rest a little bit um during the you know, during certain hours of the day, like if it's really hot or if it's super cold, they'll kind of bed down. Um, but most of the time they are eating. Um, if it's any um, help, deer poop 13 times a day on average. So sometimes it's less. I think there's some records of deer pooping like 26 times a day, um, but they poop a lot, which means that they eat a lot, right? So Yeah, okay, so is that all of her questions right now, Kristen? I have a whole bunch more written down that we can come back to. Okay, let's do that, okay, cool. Um, so yeah, in the spring, the deer start to go back to their, um, back to their summer ranges. Again, they take that same route that they took to the fall, or in the fall to their winter range. Um, and we still think that they learn this from their mom as well. And then I just talked about that surfing. Did they migrate thing. to Wisconsin. Ooh, what's that? Can you type it? I think um, the question was, do they migrate to Wisconsin? Oh, no, they do not. Um, that would be very far. But I think there, so there are white-tailed deer in Wisconsin. It's a different species of mule deer, but they <laughs> look kind of similar. And they, um, I think there are some deer in Wisconsin that will migrate. They won't be as long of migrations as the deer here in Wyoming. It'll, they'll just be like five or 10 miles or something like that. It won't be as far, but it will be, um, yeah, they, they do migrate. But none from Wyoming to Wisconsin. That'd be pretty cool though. Okay, let's see here. Okay. Okay. And so then once they make it back to their summer range, they, um, you know, they've migrated, they surfed the green wave, they ate all that good vegetation, all those good plants while they were migrating. They, you know, are trying to be strong again because they're recovering from that really harsh winter, right? Winter is really hard on deer, so they have to recover all of that fat. Um, and then when they make it back to summer range, that fawn is now one year old and that fawn doesn't isn't going to have fawns of their own quite yet but mom will actually kick them off at that point so mom at that point probably has fawns for the next year right um what is the difference between a fawn and an elk mm, so elk is a different species of a deer um, so there's like a whole group of deer, like it's called a family of deer, and that includes elk, moose, um, caribou, and mule deer, white-tailed deer, that sort of thing. Um, so elk are a similar species, but they are a different species than mule deer, 
and the babies of mule deer are called fawns and the babies of elk are called calves. Yeah, so eventually these fawns, not that year when they're one year old, but they will be kicked off from their mom at that point. They're completely independent at that point. They go off and do their own thing. And then they go through a whole nother year. So another whole nother summer, fall, winter, spring. And then by that next summer, um, when they're two or three usually, they will have fawns of their own. And so that's how we are able to have mule deer populations now. So it just relies on fawns growing up, being able to make it through that first year of life, learning all of those things that we went through, and then, um, yeah, being able to have fawns of, of their own. What so, is your life? Um, can we maybe save questions for a little bit at like a little bit later? Um, just so we make sure that everybody gets questions answered at the same time. Um, but if you just keep check uh, typing them in the box, I think Christian is, is keeping track of that. So thank you. Um, so in studying mule deer, again, I just wanted to quickly go through this because I think this is some really cool uh, we, we get to use some really cool technologies and do some really cool things. So um, we do things like use these GPS collars that I already talked about. Um, but we also get to go out and study their habitat and uh, their poop, which is really cool. So in their habitat, we go out and see like what kind of flowers are there, what sorts of plants are there, how many of them, what their general habitat is like. And then we also collect their poop. And so um, if, you're a if you're a wildlife scientist like me, um, you actually think poop is really exciting. So poop is really cool because we can learn a ton about an animal from their poop. So we can learn whether or not they were in an area because if an animal is in an area, then they were probably pooping there. So it's a good indication that they were in that area. Um, we can also learn about what they were eating um, and just a whole bunch of other things. We can get parasites, we can get um, genetic information from them, we can just get a whole bunch of stuff from poop. It's really cool. And actually, fun fact, these earrings are mule deer poop. Poop is really cool. So if you, <laughs> if you really like um, looking for animal poop, then you will probably be a, um, a very good wildlife ecologist. But we also get to use a ton of really cool technology. So to catch the adults, we have to use helicopters because they're really fast. Um, both the helicopters and the deer. So um, that's what we do to catch the animals. And then we put these GPS collars on them so we're able to see where they go throughout their entire lives. And then while we have them in hand, we take a bunch of measurements. So things like um, we measure how big they are, we weigh them, we take blood from them, we see if they're pregnant, we weigh or we um, measure their fat levels, we take a bunch of information from them. And then when we're out in the summer, um, we get to go and catch the fawns. And so I already talked about how we catch them, but we know where the fawns are um, based on their mom. So these collars emit a signal. And then you can see me on the right there. I'm holding this little thing um, and I'm looking for the fawns so that this um, receiver here is, is it's picking up the signal. And then um, that'll help us to figure out where the, where the deer and her fawns are. And then we get to go, um, and catch the fawns. So, yeah. Okay. So I think that's all I had for content. I was gonna, I was hoping we could play a game, but I think probably shouldn't play the game, and we can probably just answer questions. Um, what do you, what do you think, Kristen? Yeah, I think, um, I think that makes sense. Um, and just so you guys know, Rhiannon has a pretty cool extra thing involving a map. Um, that you guys are going to get to take a look at in the coming days. We'll make sure we send that around. Um, but yeah, you guys have so many good questions. So um, if you're okay with it, I think it'd be fun to just, first I can read off some of the ones that came up in the chat already. Um, okay. and then if folks either want to type more or if you can make sure that we're not talking over each other, but when we're done answering the ones we have written down, um, if you want to unmute yourself, um, you can try that too, and we'll see if we can keep that somewhat organized. Um, but yeah, I have like a whole bunch of questions that you guys have been asking. So cool. Um, first question, Rhiannon, do fawns recognize their family when they grow up? Mm. Oh, this is such a cool question, um, in part because I think, yes, 
they do, but I think as scientists, it's really hard to figure out exactly how they do that. Um, but when we using these things like our GPS collars or sometimes in other studies, people have put um, like ear tags in, on on the deer and they can you know know which animals are which. Um, you can see that family groups tend to stick together. Um, so yes, I think they can um, recognize their family members. I don't, excuse me, I don't 100% know how they do that, if it's based on smell or on sound or, um, you know, if they're like, oh, that's what my mom looks like, I know that. Um, but yeah, good question. Great. Um, next question. Um, a few folks want to know how heavy or is there winter fur? And do fawns get winter fur? Oh, yes. Um, let's see here. So these are their winter coats here. They're very, very fluffy. Um, and, and they're like thick and gray fur. And then in the summer, the um, fawns are, or the, the adults have really like thin brown fur. So they, their coats are very, very thick. Like if you have, um, you know, like a really thick dog fur in the winter and you can like, can't really move your fingers through it. Um, that's kind of what deer fur is like. Deer fur is a little bit rougher, but um, yeah, uh, they 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 have to stay warm throughout all of winter. And right, this is the kind of habitat that they live in, so um, they have to make sure that they they are able to stay pretty warm. Okay, next, I think you'll like this one, Rhiannon. So you talked about their collars, but what do you do when their collars fall off? <gasps> we cry. We're so sad. <laughs> Um, so sometimes, yeah, sometimes that happens, right? Like, so, um, this is a collar that we put on a fawn, if you can see that here. Um, and this one, uh, you know, it can, they can rip off. They can get caught in a fence and they can rip off, right? So, um, at that point, the, the study animal, it, we can't really know that we re-caught them. So, um, we end up just kind of saving the information that we got from that animal, but it leaves the study area. Yeah, it's really, it's really sad when we lose a uh, collar. So. Other, other folks wanted to know, um, do you also collar elk and moose? Yes, um, so uh, I am part of a research group at the University of Wyoming, and so there's a, um, we have one professor, and then there's a bunch of grad students like me, and so we all work on our different projects. I work on mule deer, but we also have people working on elk and moose and bighorn sheep. So, um, and the type of work that we do requires that we have collars on them, and we take the same measurements. So things like fat and pregnancy um, measure their babies and follow their babies through time. Um, so yes, we do all sorts of work on all sorts of ungulates across Wyoming. Um, and then how long do you deer live? Um, I think 12 or so, 12 or 15 years is probably like a very old deer. Like that's gonna be pretty old. It's, it's really hard to make a living as a deer in, a wild, in the wild, right? Like you have to make it through the winter, um, raising fawns is really expensive and hard. Um, there's predators. You might get hit by a car. You might get hunted, right? It's really, it's just, it's hard. So not a ton of animals, or it's, it's just hard to make it that long, um, but 12 or so. So what I'm going to do now, because folks have been adding more questions recently, so I'm just going to call your name and then I'll unmute you and you can ask Rianne your question. Ooh, cool. So it looks like Tanya had a question. So Tanya, I'm going to unmute you to ask your question if that's okay. Perfect. Can you hear me guys? Yes. Okay. My question, um, I'm a wildlife uh, manager for the state of Utah. So thank you for doing this. Oh, cool. Hi. <laughs> um, I would just like you to clarify maybe or, or, you know, answer the question of what do people do if they encounter a fawn in a random place? Say they are in grandma's field or a hay field, or they find a fawn in a parking lot. Can you tell the audience what you do if you find a fawn? Mm, yeah, this is a, a good question. And so I think we, you know, we want to like pick up the fawn and we want to like touch it and save it, that sort of thing. First thing I would say is to just leave it. Like, don't, don't go up to it. Don't touch it. Um, and then call your local wildlife 
biologist or game warden or conservation officer, it depends on which state you're in, um, call a local wildlife professional. Um, particularly though, and so that would be, especially if you're in, um, like a, if you are in a parking lot or something like that, you should, and then just, you know, stay away from the fawn, don't disturb it, um, but maybe stay there until the, um, the game warden or uh, wildlife biologist gets there, um, but doing whatever you can to not mess with or touch the animal. Um, but then if you're out in the wild and you see a fawn, it's probably because the mom, or, and, and you come across a mom, it's, sorry, if you are out in the wild and you come across a fawn, it's probably hiding and the mom probably knows where it is. So just leave it there and then just keep going. Um, again, so mom wants to stay not super close to the fawn throughout the entire day because that kind of draws attention to the fawn. So she wants to get out of there. So it, she probably knows where the fawn is. So um, yeah, good question. So it looks like Jill has a question about what parts of school are really important. Actually, sorry, Jill, I'm going to unmute you so you can ask. Well, I just hope I could talk to people about what um, what are really important things to do in school if you want to be a biologist. Ooh, yeah. Um, so I actually didn't know anything about going outside. Um, I didn't. I'm not from a family that hunts or hikes or anything like that. I'm from Eastern South Dakota. We don't have the public lands that we have out here in Wyoming back in South Dakota. So I never, I never went camping. I didn't know outside at all. Um, I don't even know. I think I was really interested in chemistry. I was, I was really interested in science, but I didn't know anything about wildlife. Um, but then I came to Wyoming uh, for my undergraduate degree. I came here for college and then I went out for a hike. Like a friend just took me out on a hike. And I was like, oh my gosh, this is the coolest thing I've ever done. I want to study this. I want to be out here. I want to work out here, whatever. Um, so first of all, I would just say that you don't have to, you know, start now. Like you should if you can, but you can get into science and into wildlife from a bunch of different areas like I didn't know about it at all until I was 20. Um, but if you are you know if you're younger and you really want to start if you know that you're interested in wildlife um, I would try to start learning the wildlife around you um, and take as many science and math classes as as you can in school um, and then maybe like if you have a wildlife class that is offered in school I would maybe take that you'd probably like it and enjoy it um, and then other than that, um, yeah, just try to spend your free time outside learning birds, learning plants. You should ask Jill all about plants because she knows all of them, right? So um, the cool thing about my job is that, uh, or not the cool, uh, one of the very cool things about my job is that I get to, you know, hike for fun. So um, just spending as much time outside and learning about your environment as you can, I think is good. And then, um, uh, you'll have to go to college, so this is a degree, or this is a um, a field where you pretty much need a college degree, and more and more, um, even more schooling after that um, to get a job. But that's not always the case. So, you know, there's lots of ways to be a wildlife professional. Oh, Kristen, you're muted. <laughs> I think Logan had a question about using cameras. So Logan, I'm going to unmute you so you can ask that question. Is that okay? Logan, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. So what was your question? Um, do you ever put cameras on wildlife to actually see how they care for their young? Yes, this, yes, we just did this actually, um, three weeks ago for the first time. So we don't have any cameras, any any footage back yet. We don't have any pictures or video yet, but hopefully this time next year, we will have videos. Um, and yeah, I'm so excited about this because that during that first few days of an animal's life, we have no idea what they're doing. Like, is mom coming back and sniffing them all of the time? Is Are they having like this really cool bonding experience with their mom? We don't know. We have no idea as scientists, which is I think a, a really, a really cool thing to be thinking about. So try to, you know, maybe we can talk again in a year and we'll have some information for you. Raina, I think you had a question. Yes, um, 
Um, I was asking how heavy are deer's winter coats? Mm, the, um, so their fur is probably like that thick, right? So it's, it's pretty thick and then it's, it's very dense. They're, I don't know how many, like how many hairs they have, but they have a lot of it. Um, and it's, you can see in this picture here, they're like very fluffy. Um, so that, that very fluffy coat helps them to, to stay warm. Um, Aiden, I think you had a question. I'm going to unmute you. How do you test if, to see if they're healthy or like test like, I don't know, like just like a checkup? Mm. Um, so there's a few different things. I suppose you could, you know, like do some tests for diseases. Um, you can look at parasites from their poop. So um, you can see like, yeah, if they have any bugs or anything like that um, from their poop. Another reason that poop is really cool. Um, but one of the main things that we do um, in my research group is we look at how, how much fat they have. Um, so fat for animals is a really, really important thing for them. Like if you don't have enough fat, you're not going to be able to make it through the winter. And so in the, um, let's see here. So in this picture on the, on the far right, um, somebody isn't doing it in, in actually this picture, but somebody has probably just done it, but they are measuring how much fat is on, on their, um, like on their hips and their back. So that's the best way of determining whether they're healthy and giving them a checkup basically. Um, and if, if animals have a lot of fat, then they're probably doing, then they're probably pretty healthy. Okay, it looks like Laura had some questions. So Laura, I'm gonna unmute you. Yes. Have you ever got hurt by a mama uh, deer when you were working? Yeah, uh, good question. No. So um, thankfully, I'm very thankful for that. So sometimes when um, we're kept capturing them in the winter, so in that middle, in the middle picture for this, on this slide, um, when we have them on like right there sometimes they kick a lot um so sometimes my shins will be um kind of bruised and that it does hurt um but i you know i haven't like broken any bones or anything like that from the mom um and then in the in the summer when we're catching the fawns sometimes the moms will in trying to protect their fawns they'll kind of run towards us but they never actually you know come at like they're never hitting us directly. Um, actually, probably the most dangerous part about my job is just hiking in really remote and rugged terrain. So, you know, I'm like hiking up and down mountains and that sort of thing. So I'm probably much more likely to get hurt just getting to the deer than actually by the deer itself. Um, it looks like the Wrights had some questions. So I'm gonna unmute Brianna really quickly. Ask your question, Nora. Ask your question. Okay. Um, how do deer, deers grow their winter coat? It's like, is it like a genetic thing or do they do it on purpose somehow? Ooh, um, cool. <laughs> I don't know if I have a really good answer for you. Um, so it does happen every year, right? They like grow their winter coat. They have their winter coat all winter and then they shed it and go back to their summer coat and that happens every year so there is some sort of genetic part to it um, that gives them the ability to grow that coat um, but i don't know maybe there is some sort of like you know they have to wait until it's a certain temperature and then something in their body is like okay now we start um i don't know that's a really good question i'll have to get back to you on that Thank you for asking that. You're okay. muted, Kristen. Sorry, I keep doing that. Um, so it looks like we have a question from Christy. So I'm going to unmute Christy about um, fawns and baby elk. Um, are um, fawns and baby elk like the same size when they're born, or mm. like, how similar are they? Yeah, uh, they're actually very different in size. So um, fawns, there's normally two of them that are born. So each fawn is probably like this big. Um, but baby elk uh, calves are 
uh, they normally almost always only have one uh, elk calf at a time. So those those calves are like like this big. They're like they're very big. And if you look at the difference between elk and deer, that makes sense, right? Because deer are a much smaller animal than than elk are. Um, yeah, so pretty big difference in size. And I, I've never actually caught an elk calf myself, but I've heard that, yeah, they, they're quite big and that big. So I, we've got just a couple minutes left. So um, anybody, I, I hope we got most questions. There are gonna, we have time for maybe two more. Um, I see a question from Molly and a question from Sage. And since you guys, I don't think I've gotten to ask you questions. Um, and, um, and then Rhiannon, would it be okay with you if people could send you questions later? Yeah, absolutely. So here, um, my email address is up here. Um, if you want some more information about our research and the research group that we there that I'm a part of, um, our website is right there. It's ungulatecompendium.org. And also if you're on Facebook or Instagram, we also have um, pages there. And maybe too, because a bunch of people asked about the game, um, maybe we could talk and see if there was a way we could let people know about the board game so that they could maybe learn a little bit more about migration that way. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I'd be very happy to, you know, do something else a different day um, and play the board game again. Because now, so the, like, the, the cool thing about the board game is that you should be able to learn all this stuff about deer and then you can play the board game and the board game is if you can make it as a, a whole day as a deer. Um, but you kind of need to know all of that information that we were just talking about to make the board game, like to, you know, be good at the board game. So anyway, I'm very happy to play that anytime. So maybe um, when we send around uh, an email with some more information from Rianne, and maybe we'll see if folks are interested in playing the board game sometime. Um, and maybe we can set that up. I see some head nods. So um, look for some more information about that. Um, okay, so I want to make sure to answer because I don't think Molly or Sage have gotten to ask questions. So Molly, I think you had a question. So I'm going to unmute you. Um, when you were talking about when did they ever kick you mm -hmm. and you said that you got bruised a couple times, um, is it a very strong kick or like can it be very strong or is it very light? Yeah, they are um, very strong. Deer are very, very strong. Um, and their hooves are really hard and sharp. So uh, yeah, it can be pretty painful. And normally, you know, if you just got kicked one time in the leg, like a little bit of a, you know, that kind of a kick. So they're, um, oh, also I forgot to say, their legs are, it's called hobbled together. So they're basically tied together like this. And this is so that the deer don't get hurt and that so that we as researchers also don't get hurt. So, um, so their legs are like this. So, you know, you can't really kick that much like this. Um, they can't, thankfully, because otherwise it would really, really hurt, but they're still pretty strong even like that. My legs will be kind of, you know, purple by the end of a good capture run because we're doing multiple deer per day. So, um, but they're really cool. They're really strong and I'm, they have to be feisty, right? They have to be fighters. They live in a really harsh environment. So whenever I get kicked, I'm like, okay, yeah, this is good. I'm, you're a fighter. You're going to make it. So. Okay. Last question for today before we say goodbye. Um, so Sage, I think you had a question about roads. So Sage, do you want to ask your question? Yeah. How do deer cross the highway? Yeah, um, this is a really good question and it's a big part of scientific research right now. Um, so deer will kind of eat next to the road a lot of times, right? Like we'll be driving around and we'll, we'll just see them along the side of the road. Um, but they, and they, they kind of look around, but they, you know, they're not used to living in an environment where there are vehicles that go 80 miles per hour. So they're just not quite equipped for that. Um, so sometimes they'll cross, but uh, unfortunately sometimes they, they end up getting hit. Um, and that's when the, there's those collisions, but more and more, and actually in my study area, so the deer that I'm studying are in the Western part of Wyoming and there's more and more um, wildlife crossings. And so that can help here because otherwise, you know, if you're a deer and you don't, 
know that cars are dangerous, you might just like walk into the side of the road or across the road and not really, you know, look both ways. They don't, they don't know look both ways like we do. Um, but with these wildlife crossings, like overpasses and underpasses, they're able to, um, go across the highway in a, in a much safer way. And of course we can't do that for, um, all parts of Wyoming and all roads everywhere, but we can do it in places where there's a lot of, um, deer crossing the roads or like, um, if there's a point in the road where a lot of deer are crossing during their migration or something like that. So yeah, good question. Good question. All of these are just really good questions. These, this is just so fun. So before we go, there's two things. Um, one is that Noah really wanted to show us his pet bird whose name is Mango. So <laughs> Noah, I'm going to unmute you for a second so you can tell us a little bit about Mango. Okay. <laughs> um, well, yeah, she's the sun conure and um, she likes to bite uh, me and mom a lot, but like sometimes not that hard. She, um, doesn't, she doesn't like uh, green books. Uh, she will. Uh, just, I don't really know how to explain, but she's just a really cool pet. Yeah. Thank you for showing us Mango. Mm -hmm. uh, everybody else, I'm going to unmute everybody so we can all clap for Rhiannon. Well, thank you, Rhiannon. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So um, everybody is muted now. Um, and so um, thank you guys for joining us today. Thanks for um, letting us work out the kinks a little bit as we tried this out. Um, we will send some follow up emails in the coming few days with some more information. No. <laughs> You're crushing me. <laughs> Hold on. Um, and for those of you, I'll, I'll talk to Rhiannon in a little bit. And for those of you who are interested in the game, we'll make sure we get information out there, as well as a special map related activity about migration that Rhiannon has put together for you guys. So thank you all for joining us. We're really happy you could come um, and watch your emails because not only we're gonna have more information about migration and Rhiannon's talk today, um, but we're gonna keep doing stuff like this too. So we're Hope we can bring you more scientists and more cool facts about wildlife and special places in Wyoming. So thanks for coming, everybody. Thank you, Rian. Thank you, Rian. Bye. 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 Thank you all for coming. I really appreciate it. And thank you for your questions. Bye. 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 <laughs>